This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp to provide you with access to the largest online therapy service in the world. And it can all be done from the comfort of your own home, from a phone, tablet or laptop. No commute, cutting down travel costs and most importantly, it's affordable. With over a thousand therapists in the UK, BetterHelp can provide access to mental health professionals with a wide variety of expertise in mental health. If you need someone to talk to and you're thinking of giving therapy a go, BetterHelp is a great option. And being a listener of the podcast, you get 10% off. That's 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash life and film. That's betterhelp.com forward slash life and film. Welcome to a life in film. I'm Elliot James Langridge. I'm an actor, writer, and apparently a podcaster. And I love film. This is the podcast that we ask our guests from in front and behind the camera, how did they get their foot in the door? What was the key to unlocking their success? What's their story? Our guest's first introduction to show business was in the writer's room at Saturday Night Live. Many years later, she's one of the most respected casting directors in the business. From the massively popular series The Great, to casting Emma Stone in both The Favourite and most recently the critically acclaimed Poor Things. Up next is the hugely anticipated Dune Part 2. Our guest today is casting director... It's a life and fail! I seek outings and adventures. Bella's so much to discover. You're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. I am finding being alive fascinating. Bella. Why I keep it in my mouth if it is revolting? (laughs) I must go punch that baby. We must experience everything, not just the good, but degradation. Shall we sing? Horror. Sadness. Bella! And we can know the world. And when we know the world, the world is ours. We need more. No more. Oh. And the more's too much. How did you get into casting? What was the. Where did that kind of love of that come from? That's a very interesting question. I think they're two different questions. I think I the love comes from always being a watcher and a seeker and trying to understand um, the context and landscape of what's going on around, always looking and operating at a level um, below the surface. Um, so I think that's always made me interested in psychology and motivation. Um, and also in how we see things through different lenses. And then I think later on in life, I got interested in how those lenses are usually dictated by the narratives that we're taught or shown or that we grow up with and they're cultural and political and how to kind of raise the questions and unravel. And I think in the more, in the latter part of of my development, I've become more interested in the value of that, that that film and television as something that's grown and become more available in many greater ways with the internet and platforms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Like the power of that, the significance that through what we put on the screen, we can change the way people think. So that's one answer. And then the other answer is how did I get into it literally? Mm. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So that's a really good question. Um, I finished school and um, wanted to take a year off, was hoping to get into university, wanted to read something like English um, and needed to, wanted to travel, but also needed a job. And... um, through a set of circumstances, I managed to get this incredible opportunity, which was to go and work on a live TV show in America, uh, the much loved Saturday Night Live. And I spent oh, wow. um, a season 
in the writer's room and in the studio when the live shows were going out. And it was a bit of a Baptist by fire. I was quite young. I was in Manhattan and I was suddenly in this very creative, very um, irreverent, I guess, and rule breaking, clever, funny environment with some very talented, um, unusual people. Mm. And so I think that gave me the sort of first step into show business as a job. And then it was actually there that I learned about the agent because they would all ring up to speak to the cast members. Mm. And then when I got back to London after university, I went to work for an agency and found out about the casting director. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, wow, that's not what I expected. That's not something that I found when I was kind of, you know, trying to dig up your, your past. And that's... um. Wow, that must have been really interesting. That must have been a very, especially going over there and being British and um, that whole experience. What can, can we go a little bit into how that happened? Like where you were saying it was kind of a lead up of circumstances, but well, it was a, it was a, it was, um, it was through people who knew people. I just got very lucky. Mm-hmm. Um, I suppose it was a time where those things were a little bit more accessible if you knew somebody who knew somebody. Kind of intern programs and things like that were very new, culturally very new. And I think Mm -hmm. that there was just a sort of opening and the fact that I was English, I'd come from England and I had certain doors opened through through knowing people. And so it's not a particularly helpful thing because I think it's a kind of opportunity that arose Mm -hmm. pretty unusually. I I feel like that's... Yeah, you say unusually, but there's there's so many people we have on here and it's it feels like a lot of luck and a lot of chance and a lot of sliding doors moments. And it sometimes it is just that. And um, it obviously put you in a good place. And, and now, you you know, you're doing you're doing pretty well. <laughs> so it was a good it was a good platform to to obviously go into what you're doing now. And in terms of going into the casting side of things before you became a casting director, um, there's a whole list of films um that you were involved with in the casting I don't know would it be associate would it be I don't know what you call it casting associate I I trained for quite a long time so I was an assistant then I was an associate then I looked did children Mm. Um, and then my so my first kind of big job that sort of propelled me was casting all the young adults on atonement Mm. which obviously included um Saoirse and all the kids Mm-hmm. Um, which was quite a big part of that film. Yeah, amazing film. And you've worked with Joe Wright a few times, and that's obviously a relationship that you, that's grown over the years. But some of the lists of just the people that you've worked with, and uh, did you, as a kid, did you have a lot of interest in film? Would it, kind of, you know, working with people like, I mean, Steven Spielberg or someone like that, was that, you know, you look at that and you go, oh, wow, that's like, he's an icon of the screen. Um, do, are there people that you've worked with along the way that you were kind of familiar with um, as a kid growing up? Yes, definitely. That's a really interesting point because um, it's funny how time cheats. Like you start, you you know, you're very young and there are these people out there and then you catch up with those people out there and that's then the next generation do the same thing. But when you're young, those people seem so far away. <laughs> so that's, I always find that timeline interesting. Um, I grew up around a lot of filmmakers, um, mainly writers and directors, um, some European. So I guess that was in my my pathology. Um, it was held in high regard. Um, my my parents uh, and the people around were sort of intellectuals and creative types who liked ideas and talking. Um, and I think that was, you know, so... Um, I guess I've sort of been drawn to and been drawn in by similar types of filmmakers to those. Um, Joe Wright, sort of as a director, along with Gina Jay, who I trained with, who I considered to be a great mentor. I, um, I, I, he gave me my sort of first big break um, obviously with Atonement and then consequently the films we worked on together afterwards and we also did a play called A Season in the Congo at the Young Vic with Daniel Kalula about Patrice Lumumba 
I got, I've just got to do, I've been very lucky. I've got to work with very unusual, clever people who are big thinkers and want to um, address issues. And I think that's definitely been a theme throughout and also something that I've always been attracted to. And sometimes I think, okay, come on, Dixie, now it's time to do. But then it's crazy because I'll go into a job interview with someone really impressive. And yes, we still interview. Um, <laughs> and they'll be like, oh my God, I can't believe you like cast Pugsy, the dog movie, and the casting <laughs> up was so great. And I'm like, buried that one. <laughs> and then I go back and I look at the cast and it is, it's full of like incredible people like Olivia mm. Coleman and Pete Saravenowitz and lots of other brilliantly talented, funny people. And I think, God, isn't that funny that you do these random things? But coming, going back onto track, I think I've just been lucky to work with very smart people from, you know, David Hare to um, Alfonso Cuaron to... Um, hey, the list, You've got the list. i blank because I'm at that <laughs> time in my life. Um, well, I can. I've got a list here. <laughs> who, it, the writer of Beirut, who's a brilliant writer. That one I haven't got. <laughs> but then gone on to. I wanted to go in chronological order because obviously I'm a perfectionist. Yeah. Um. So David Hare and um, Tony Gilroy. He's a genius. Tony Gilroy. The writers like David David Hare and Tony Gilroy, and then to kind of progress, you know. As, as things go developed to then, you know, working with the likes of people I work with now, like Yorgos Lanthimos and Tony McNamara. You know, these are really, really clever, mm. unusual people taking subjects and material and turning them inside out. So that's a real privilege. It, yeah, I mean, it feels like you're, the, particularly in the recent years, your films have got a real, you almost like know they've been cast by you because they there are certain there's a certain flavour to it. And, and I mean, working with Yorgos, is that how you say his name? I'm dyslexic, so I <laughs> apologise if I got it wrong. Yorgos, um, yeah. Yorgos. Um, I mean, obviously working with him several times, um, I mean, what his films are just visionary. They're just so beautiful and I cannot wait to see Poor Things. I mean, that's like on my top list of films to see um, next year. It must be, It must be incredible. What a playground that must be to be able to cast those films. Absolutely, yeah really exciting um and uh yeah i mean i mean that wasn't really a question was it i suppose but, <laughs> but, but um, I, I i just feel like the cast is always really interesting and i mean with the favorite at the time i remember thinking emma stone playing that character i was like wow this is gonna be really interesting this is gonna be a real different role for her um and how, I mean, just to go into sort of casting that, how did that come about? How did that decision to, you know, it's a, sometimes when you bring an American actor to come in and, and do a role that's, um, you know, got a British accent and that it's kind of, it's quite a lot to ask and it's, she's an incredible actress. So, I mean, it's obviously she'd pull it off, but um, yeah, how did she's, that come about? She's, she's a brilliant, extremely accomplished, versatile character actress, as well as a magnificent movie star. Mm. Um, I think that with casting Americans doing English accents, it's often just about feeling the way through and some are up for doing it and so, and others are less. And um, in fact, in Poor Things, we have some very interesting Americans doing very good accents. Um, so I think it's a kind of case by case. Mm. It doesn't always translate, but generally the ones that are, embrace it, um, it's yeah, I mean, it's, um, I think also these things are always much more about the characterization than they are about the sort of isolating aspects. Mm, of course. So especially the way we're now working much more in kind of a global world where the definition of an English accent is kind of less rigid than what it was actually fairly recently, maybe seven years ago mm. um because we're all sharing we're all things are much more accessible to all of us so we're watching a lot more aren't we um and um but what's interesting about 
the what I've always been attracted attracted to um, with the kind of material and the creatives that I've worked with is I think at quite an early age, um, I like you. I I was I am dyslexic and I um, struggled a lot with reading and I grew up in a very literary family and so I think for me cinema very early on became um, a way to get information. Mm and a way to explore um, subjects and learn about subjects that I couldn't necessarily access in other ways. And because reading was always a pressure or something that was kind of a task that needed to be overcome rather than something you could just absorb. Mm. Like so many people experience with reading, they lose themselves in reading. Whereas reading for me was always really hard work and somewhere I felt inadequate. So I think my curiosity about seeking truth and understanding dynamics and what's going on combined with wanting to know about things and learn about things, that that was what what films and cinema served for me. And I think I'm very aware of that now, going back to the like, what type of films I work on. I always, I've spent a lot of my career working on smaller, less high profile films, but that will, I've always been motivated by the subject matter. Mm. Um, is there an idea here or something that can be kind of explored and 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 sort of uncovered further? Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's that's what I was just with the projects that you've done. And then looking back at when you kind of started out and you just looking at the list of things that you worked on. And now it feels like you have a real yeah flavor to your work. And it's like, um you know, when you see a Spielberg film, you kind of know it's Spielberg. You can tell. Um, and it feels like that with your work. Just to list off the films, we obviously mentioned Atonement, um, but In Bruges, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, A Good Year, Last King of Scotland, Munich, which is obviously Steven Spielberg, Layer Cake, Prince of Az- Azkaban, which you mentioned, Shaun of the Dead. It's just like, it's a crazy list. When you were, you know, obviously working on these movies and then is it is it it must be difficult to then be like, right, I'm going to now, I want to be a casting director to move up and them be in charge is that I kind of I don't know I'm trying to relate it to say like if you're in the camera department and going from focus puller to operator it's kind of like a it's a big leap what was the drive behind that did you always know that you wanted to like be in charge and and kind of you know really create that cast from from the ground up so sorry just to understand the question so the question is with with working across so many like legendary cult really brilliant films as an associate assistant Mm. what's the point where you want to take the reins yourself yeah sorry that was a really convoluted way of saying it but that's it I was it was really enjoyable listening to you and I think I realized wow those films are all incredible they're all kind of like quite culturally defining and actually some of those were less sort of self-serious like some of the ones I was thinking about um um and they generally all tend to be really interesting directors' first films. All the directors that now are kind of holding the kind of top station, um, they're all, they're sort of cutting their teeth movies. Um, I, I personally never felt this massive urgency to run something and be in charge. Probably that's the thing I find most challenging about being a casting director is it's quite, you're quite isolated and, um, running a team and running a business isn't something that I ever imagined I would do or particularly have any skill set at doing. I'm a creative person who likes to be very organized and efficient because that supports creativity for me. Discipline. I'm interested in discipline, but I, I, I'm so, so in simple answer to your question, I think it was just a natural progression. I think I probably held on to kind of Gina's skirt for years in a way that now people want to kind of do casting for eight months and become an associate and then start casting in their own right. And probably I'm one of the last, sort of the last generation of people who really saw it as you train, you invest, you do those years and then you earn the stripes. I know that's very unfashionable right now, but that is how I was brought up. Mm. 
Has it? I mean, I actually industry. don't know. Has it changed quite a bit now? Is it? Is it a different format? Yes. Yes. Well, people. I think are... People want to um, progress very quickly. Hmm. Um, everybody's interested in the end goal rather than. I think there's much less kind of significance and servitude. I don't even know that's the right word, hmm. but sort of um, holding in high regard the train, the kind of, the process of getting to where you get. Mm -hmm. um, but again, as I said at the beginning, you know, everything we believe is just a narrative and a story that we've been fed or experienced. So I'm open-minded to people, you know, moving really fast. Mm. Um, I mean, the whole game has changed even, well, for me, I started acting when I was 19 and now 36. <laughs> And like the difference between when I started and now, you know, obviously a lot of things are on tape. Um, I mean, it was almost video cassette when I started. <laughs> it feels like, um, you know, sending off tapes. But now it's like it feels like a lot of it's done over Zoom, like we are chatting now. And um, do, do you do you still find that you are able to do um, castings in the room or is it is it primarily tape these days? Yeah, but for me, it's been quite a long time like that, like pre the pandemic, because mm. I think working internationally a lot um, and also realising, again, from the very beginning of my career, I've always looked far and wide. I'm always interested in pushing the boundaries, trying new stuff, um, inviting different people to the party, questioning how is this going to be interpreted? How's it going to feed into kind of stigmas and ideas? So I've always liked the fact that the internet, which did exist when I started training, just about, <laughs> uh, meant that we could um, cast people further away. Mm. Um, you know, again, in the days when I was learning how to do what I did and on atonement, for example, I drove around all of Southern England and went into 99% of all the boarding schools. Again, on Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, I went into 100 boys prep schools. Um, so whereas now that's not necessary. It's all mm. done through social media, uh, the searches for the young significant roles are all done via the internet. Mm. So I think in simple answer to your question, quite early on, I got interested in, oh, okay, we can actually reach, we can reach far and wide. And so I've always had a tradition of meeting actors for a cup of tea, getting to know them as people, because that really helps me. And then doing stuff with readings is fine. And as long as I meet them periodically, so I'm up to speed on, you know, what's going on and where they're at with the kind of what they're channeling and their interests, because part of what we do is like, how is so-and-so going to interpret this and are they going to be suitable and are they going to want to play this role, especially as you get to actors who are at the point where they can pick and choose a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so I embrace readings, you know, chatting to you now. I mean, it didn't even occur to me that we were not having a meeting until you pointed out we're on Zoom because <laughs> I got so used to this. Yeah, yeah. No, it must be. It must be just, it's just, it, it's not only easier, but it is, it's just efficient, isn't it? And, um, but it means you can do a lot more because we, mm. there is a lot more, but mm. we can't cheat the 24 hour clock. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. So, unfortunately, yet, yeah. <laughs> yet, yes. I'm sure, I'm sure one day there'll be a, there'll be something they can do about that. Now for a quick break. Are you a writer, director, actor, costume designer, perhaps makeup artist? Are you interested in camera? This is the place to show your journey. We want to hear from you. How did you start your career? Has it started yet? And perhaps if you're feeling brave, share with us your most embarrassing film related moment. So slip into our DMs at Life in Film Pod on Instagram. Check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash life in film where you'll get episodes early and uncut amongst other treats. And don't forget to follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you enjoy this episode, please leave us a positive rating. Add us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok at Life in Film Pod and find our video episodes on YouTube by searching Elliot James Language Life in Film. Essentially, please like and subscribe everything. It makes a huge difference. Thank you. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you work in the film industry? Are you freelance? 
or perhaps you have a nine to five. No matter what you do, mental health affects us all. I struggled early on in my career with the uncertainty of if and when I would ever work again, struggling to pay my bills or simply with anxiety. Don't know about you, but being an actor, it's very important for me to maintain structure in the downtimes. And I found not only exercise, but talking to someone for me was a game changer. And so Life in Film has partnered with BetterHelp to provide you with access to the largest online therapy service in the world. And it can all be done from the comfort of your own home, from a phone, tablet or laptop. No commute, cutting down travel costs, and most importantly, it's affordable. With over a thousand therapists in the UK, BetterHelp can provide access to mental health professionals with a wide variety of expertise in mental health. If you need someone to talk to and you're thinking of giving therapy a go, BetterHelp is a great option. And being a listener of the podcast, you get 10% off. That's 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash life and film. That's betterhelp.com forward slash life and film. And back to the show. And I, I want to, I actually didn't realize that you're dyslexic as well. So I, I want to ask, um, I, you know, it's something that I not struggled with, but I, you know, find lining, le- lining, <laughs> I can't even get the word the right way around learning lines um for an audition can be quite tricky sometimes depending on the time that i'm given and you know it, do you think it's a thing that i should mention or just get on with it do you have any advice for you know someone coming in that does struggle with dyslexia um any sort of i don't know like is it something i should it's tell a really, them? it's a really interesting one because now it's kind of everyone's embracing these things aren't they mm. Um, so we're in a sort of watershed or a, we're in a kind of transition time. My in response is just get on with it. Mm-hmm. But that's not necessarily right. That's just, <laughs> that's too, just what I did. Yeah. Huh? It's usually my my way of doing it. I often too. think if I point it out, it's like a deflection mm. from actually what I can do. Yeah. Um, and also I'm again, you know, get uh, it, it's like... It, there wasn't the forum for this stuff so you were always kind of just more developing coping mechanisms mm. and I find and I don't know if you relate to this but for me a lot with dyslexia is being able to try and concentrate on the right thing so if I get too distracted by something else that's not going to help me so I would just prepare myself as best I can and um go into the situation and then maybe if it was a disaster I would say can I have another opportunity or I just FYI I'm dyslexic. Mm-hmm. But I yeah. don't know because maybe it's better to preempt it. As I've... a dyslexic, yeah. I don't make any difference if you tell me you're dyslexic or not, because when I'm looking at an actor's tape, I'm not interested in perfectionism. I'm not mm. interested in knowing the lines. I'm not interested in any of that. I'm just interested in essence and energy and what that brings into the equation. Mm. Well, that's reassuring because I think I think that's the when you go into audition and they go, oh, don't forget about the script, just do a bit of impro. I'm like, <laughs> it's just that it takes the pressure off and it doesn't become a line learning exercise for me then. Um, so that's good because I, I do, you know, I do feel sometimes you go in and and you feel like you want to get every single word right, but then you're you're not concentrating on the right thing. No, no. Um, yourself. Exactly. And, and, and to, to ask, go off that um, in general, like someone coming in and, and having a meeting with you, if it is in the room, um, what advice would you give to an actor? I mean, you kind of gave a little bit there in terms of, you know, it's an essence that you're looking for, but is there any advice you give just in general coming in and doing an audition? Um, obviously be on time. That's probably a key one, but. <laughs> yeah. Generally in life. It's good. Yeah. Um... Just, I mean, it just sounds like a cliche, but I mean, just be, I, be prepared, you know, prepare yourself knowing what, what, what you need as a person. Um, I have more fun if I'm well prepared. If I'm not prepared, I feel more confused. That's personal to me. So I would say, do the best you can, take time to prepare, um, probably do that a day or two before so that things ruminate and then interesting th- allows interesting things to come up for you. This is actually my life practice. So I don't even, 
But in terms of coming to the room as an actor, there's no there's no right or wrong. You've just got to bring yourself. Mm. Because I, again, this is my style of casting, but I'm just interested in truth and what you're going to bring to the equation and how that's going to, what recipe that's going to result in. Mm. I feel exactly the same in terms of preparation allows you to play and it allows you to be relaxed. And if you go into a room and you're like, just thinking, working it out, you're spinning. Yeah. Out. Your brain's just overworking when it should be easier than that. <laughs> yeah. I'm giving me flashbacks of um, awful auditions I've had, but um, I also want to, with an audition, I mean, a lot of actors listen to this podcast and um obviously speaking to you and hearing it from your side of the table is really interesting. I, I wonder if, um, because we've all had horror stories, we've all had moments <laughs> as actors in the room that, um, you know, things have gone wrong, but on your side of things, do you have any, do you have a story that you're willing to tell that, that was, uh, about your questions. <laughs> you're like, I'm not doing that one. <laughs> Where do I start? I Can just I... want to go back. One yeah, step sure, sure. about advice, because this, is, this yeah. is really good advice, and I've noticed it slipping with um is is watch the director's films. Mm -hmm. Watch his films, know his work. Yeah. That's way more important when you meet a director or a creative. So in our case, watch watch our films. Come into the meeting and have having watched a couple of our films. Like you've said to me a couple of times in this interview, and I found it really reassuring that in my work, you can see X, Y, and Z. Now you may just be fluffing it, but <laughs> it's, it feels like I'm engaging with somebody who's engaged yeah, and then yeah, we yeah. have an engaged conversation. So I think that's an absolute key is going in to meet a casting director, the great body of work, just watch a couple of her things, mm. his things, going in to meet a director, watch his work. I've never met a director who is, doesn't respond to like, they know they've seen my work. They know my work. They care. They're invested. Mm. That's great. That's a great. That's a really yeah, original. Right. I haven't heard that one before. Most embarrassing moments, yeah. I don't know if I can answer that question. You want me to? <laughs> I mean, I was trying to think things. Um, can I? I've seen a lot of stuff over the years. I'm sure. <laughs> um, when you said at the beginning, oh, I was looking on the internet, I was thinking, oh my God, what stuff? <laughs> Don't I've worry, been, I'm not I've lived a few lives um, and I've been around creative people and for a very long time. Mm. So are there casting stories? Not, not one I can specifically lay out. Mm. Um, there are just lots. Can I, can I perhaps give you one? Probably of, aren't a, yeah. <laughs> can I perhaps give you one of mine and just see what... 100%. If I did the right thing in the situation. Yes. <laughs> it was absolutely horrendous. Um, and this wasn't long ago either. <laughs> Unfortunately, I thought I was beyond um, making these sort of mistakes. But um, I went in for a... It was, a, it was for a commercial and it wasn't too long ago. I think it was probably as we were kind of coming out of covid probably and um it was like the first audition in the room that i'd had in a long time we'd all been kind of waiting for that moment and um you know pretty just i wouldn't normally be that nervous but i was pretty nervous just because it'd been so long and um i'm there and I, I mean i'm sure you know what it's like with the you know all the like commercial castings there's a lot of people lined up everyone's there waiting and um i saw a couple of couple of people i knew and went oh hi hi and uh, they called my name so oh, you got five minutes your next one in so i was like okay cool i'm gonna pop to the toilet and then i'll i'll come back and i'll be ready and uh, so i went downstairs to the toilet in this place and um the toilets basically don't have they they didn't have a i went in there and there wasn't any doors and and it was kind of a bit of a weird kind of layout I went to the end and there was one toilet that did have a door, but it was a bit broken and there was no lock or anything. So I just went to the end. I'm in there. And as I'm in there, someone comes in and I tried to pull the door closed while I was distracted. I managed to pee down my trousers so badly that it was down to my knee. And I had like light jeans on. So this was just like... <laughs> Bless you. I looked down and I thought... 
I am in my mid thirties. How has this <laughs> happened? <laughs> I thought I'm gonna have to do a Mr. Bean, like stand by the dryer and try and dry off my trousers or do anything, something. Um, I came to the conclusion that that wasn't gonna work. And so I just wet my entire jean so that right. my jeans were one color, but obviously <laughs> wet. <laughs> At least you washed them. Yeah, I pretty much washed myself. Went I think the... that's... Go on, sorry. <laughs> um, I went into the casting and, you know, obviously they show your hands, profiles. And I, because my I tried to pull my shirt right down so it could kind of cover, even though I'd wetted the whole thing. So I'm doing this. And they're like, can you put your hands on? I'm trying not to lift my shirt up. It was the worst. But um, I don't know if the casting director noticed. I think she just noticed I was being a bit strange. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Um, um, I did... think I think that's fine. I think it would have been <laughs> fine if you'd come in. No one would have probably noticed. I think the thing is we, we're sensitive creatures. I'm going to mm. clump us all together in this creative very 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 niche growing quickly but very niche arena and um you know we think that everyone's thinking about us and generally they're not they're thinking mm. about all the things they've got to deal with and i think that you um i don't know i just we've all got children inside us we all you know i think it's okay <laughs> thank you that's what i needed to hear i need to hear that i hope the thing is i i bet you didn't get the job no <laughs> no i uh, <laughs> i didn't i i'm normally quite on i don't get flustered if i'm prepared and and i was prepared i was just also oh. very thrown yeah very wet um, yeah, a very a lot wetter than I expected to be in the room. So um, <laughs> it didn't go down too well, I don't think. But um, but this has been great. Thank you so much for coming on and and um, taking the time. And I couldn't actually remember how much time you let me have, but I presume it was around this amount. So um, I'll let you go and 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 uh, get on with your day. But um, yeah, really appreciate it. And um, I also wanted to say actually. Um, yeah, don't worry, I'm not in a mad rush. Okay. Um, I just want to say thank you for seeing me for the great as well. Not only because I came in and got to audition for it and it, it's a great show, but you introduced me to the show because beforehand I watched the, I literally smashed the whole first season, <laughs> like literally before I did the tape. Um, and because there wasn't much time on it, I remember I, I was like, I'll just watch one more, I'll watch one more. I've got to do the tape now. So you introduced me to the show and I'm really enjoying it. And I'm halfway through the second season at the moment. Um, He's but... a very clever man, Tony. We've got to see what he does next. Hopefully yeah. we'll get you uh, into that. I love it. I think it's such a unique show and Nicholas Hull and just everyone in it is just, um, just brilliant. And it's, yeah, it's just off the wall, isn't it? It's, you don't know what's coming next. And uh, yeah, I love it. But um, yeah, thank you. Didn't ask me what my favourite films were. Oh, okay. Let's do that. Let's do that. It's only because that's the only <laughs> thing I thought about. They're not my favourite. It was your first films, and I thought that's a really interesting question. Oh, of course, because, yeah. Because obviously, I can remember like because it made me look back and think, what are the first films that had an impression on me? Like mm. that's got to be part of why I'm here. And uh, you know, obviously, there's bits and bobs that you remember glimpses of as a child, like Snow White and stuff like that. But the first film that I can remember seeing in the cinema was a film called Cry Freedom, which was Richard Attenborough's, a film about Steve Biko and uh, the ANC and apartheid in South Africa. And it was, it was, I think going back to what we said at the beginning, it was when I realized that like cinema, not consciously realized, but for me, cinema became somewhere where you mm. educated people about things that you otherwise would have no insight because in those days obviously that was all very removed um you only relied on reporting and I was really quite young so and then I was looking back at the cast today at just how amazing crazy amazing Denzel Washington playing Steve Biko and um um yeah so, I have to check that out. I've never, I've not seen that. Yeah, and the other one that I realised I watched quite so that was 1987, and I saw that in the cinema, and the so I must have been pretty young, 
probably I was taken to the cinema by my parents. Um, the other film that had that I remember one of the earliest films I saw was The Lady Sings the Blues, which was Diana Ross playing mm. Billie Holiday. And that was 1972, but I obviously saw that on television. I remember one Christmas. Anyway, I wanted uh... to say that because that question made me think about how I relate to films yeah, yeah. and why maybe I'm not casting, you know, comedies. Every day, mm. every day of the week. I say that. And oh. the great is a compliment. <laughs> anyway. I, I mean, poor things looks pretty funny as well. <laughs> <laughs> that is wild. Uh, yeah. Is very I'm funny. looking forward it's to that. It's also very serious in some ways. Um, <laughs> do you, um, can I ask, do you have a favourite? I mean, it's a ridiculous question because yeah. it's very difficult to pinpoint, but do you have a few films that you kind of put up there and go, that's something that I could watch anytime. Love it. What, in generally in Just, life? Yeah, I mean, like, this is a broad question. I mean, I can't even answer it, so I don't know why I'm asking you. I mean, the only film that I can watch multiple times, because I actually find films quite hard to watch more than once, because the mm. memory for me, mm. the impact that they have on me at the time is part of the memory. Mm. And that's the bit that I, if I go back, I might see it differently and then change that relationship. Mm. The one film I can repeat, watch on repeat, is a film called Trading Places. Oh, so good. Eddie Murphy. <laughs> yeah. And Dan so Aykroyd. And, and actually all the, the early 1970s, the sort of 70s Saturday Night Live lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dan Aykroyd and um, what's her name? Bill Murray. Um, oh, uh, what's her name? Um, short hair. Uh, Halloween. I forgot that name. Oh no! You see, you're you're doing what I did. What I did. True Lies. Um, Fish Called Wanda. <laughs> um, stop it! I'm gonna have to look that up. That's gonna haunt me. Um, <laughs> Jamie Lee Curtis. Jamie Lee uh, Curtis. <laughs> and she's it. around. But I keep seeing yeah. her at the moment. She's popping yeah. up. Yeah. Oh no, my she's god! She's in everything at the moment. Paralyzed yeah. both of us. <laughs> what was the one at the beginning that we were oh we did it we got it tony gilroy tony gilroy it's yeah. too much the um the filing cabinet you know yeah i oh know it's awful it's i'm pulled down you're too young you're too young to say that but my filing cabinet i thought shh, shh, shh. <laughs> um, i actually i have a strange memory where um I, it, it mainly for 80s and 90s films i can if my girlfriend's like oh when did love actually come out i'm like 2003 <laughs> like i have i can remember the dates but i can't remember like the cast as well it's really odd i don't know if that's a that's how your brain that's how your brain yeah, works very another good. legendary very film but i don't know how many times i could watch it but i could go back it's ferris bueller's day off oh uh, yeah i would still put trading places at the top uh trading i mean both in fact that's funny you mentioned that that is a film that i've got on the wall behind the uh, laptop. <laughs> it's so I love, good i love it so timeless, much timeless just goes on and on it's so um, good Okay, well, I'll let you go. Thank you very much for having me. Well, thank you so much soon. for taking the time. We'll see you soon. Yeah, all the Out best. Pee fronted trousers, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I'll try not to pee myself. I'll know next time you're very wet, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. If the life and film motherfuckers subscribe and like and follow. Thank you to our guest Dixie and thank you to her team. And thank you, as always, to our sponsor, BetterHelp.